Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us for another a virtual Western Neighborhoods Project program. My name is Nicole Meldahl. I'm Executive Director of Western Neighborhoods Project. And tonight we're all gathered around our individual screens for San Francisco, then and now, with our dear friend and inimitable historian, John Martini. Before we get going tonight, though, um, I'd like to introduce uh, who we are for folks who maybe don't know. So we, of course, are Western Neighborhoods Project. We're a 501c3 California nonprofit that has preserved, interpreted, and shared the diverse history and culture of San Francisco's West Side since 1999. And if you go to our website, which is outsidelands.org, and sign up for our monthly email, you too can stay in the know about all of the fun things that we do, like our weekly podcast, Outside Land San Francisco, events like this, as well as history walks and pub crawls that John and I do together sometimes, <laughs> articles, videos, so much more. We do a lot of work for a little teeny tiny neighborhood history nonprofit. And in support of this work, we launched the OpenSF History Program in 2014 to digitize and make accessible online thousands of historical images that reach citywide. Now, you can peruse that archive at opensfhistory.org by map, by key term, by search engine, by recent updates. It really is a choose your own adventure of exploring the city through vintage photographs, which is coincidentally kind of what we're doing tonight. And speaking of adventures, we are a lovable branding nightmare, uh, but you can find us so many different places online. We're on Twitter for as long as Twitter is around and Instagram as Outside Lands with a Z and OpenSF History. We're also on Facebook, YouTube, and Eventbrite as Western Neighborhoods Project and Outside Lands. And I know we have a lot of brands going on, but we are beta testing some new branding, which you see in the center. If you like it, let us know. Oh, it might be our new brand <laughs> moving forward into the 22nd century. And of course, all of this work, all the things we put online, all the programs we do, it, it costs us a lot of money to do it in San Francisco. So many of you have already made a donation tonight. Thank you so much. Many of you are already members of Western Neighborhoods Project. Thank you for that support as well. We'll be putting a donation link in the chat which um, Chelsea and I will be keeping an eye on through the night. If you really like what you see, give us a five, a high five that is actually a $5 bill. <laughs> that helps us keep the history going. And it also helps us pay John Martini for his time, which is very valuable. And one more thing before we get this show on the road, a little bit of housekeeping before our main event. So we are recording this and it will be on the Western Neighborhoods Project YouTube channel afterwards. But please feel free to type your questions in the chat as we go along. Chelsea will be keeping track of them. And then at the end of the program, we'll be uh, 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 softballing them to John so he can answer. And uh, just a little reminder, this is a webinar, so we won't be able to see your beautiful faces, but we do know you're there. And as you're in the chat, remember to stay polite, stay your charming, amazing selves. Um, so we can keep this a safe space. And also remember, which I just found out recently, that if you're private uh, DMing each other, we can see that when we download the chat later. So <laughs> there are no private spaces here. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my sharing here. And I'm going to give the reins over to John Martini for the night. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me to do this program. I've been taking then and now photographs of San Francisco, actually unintentionally since, since I was a kid. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, I grew up in, in the city and uh, for uh, started taking photographs when I was about 13 years old. For many years, I was a National Park Service employee. I was both a park ranger and a park curator. And then after retiring, 
began doing contract work for the park. A lot of it was focused on sites that I had grown up in, like uh, oh, the Land's End, Sutro area, um, Alcatraz, where I worked as a park ranger, doing cultural resource uh, investigations and reports and studies. I am not an architect, I'm a historian, but I would team up with the architects and engineers to do historic structure reports, to do um, resource studies and to do interpretive studies. And uh, one of the things that I did was I fell back on my skills as a photographer, using historic photos and re-photographing the same areas to basically to watch changes over time. Re-photography, a lot of people do it. it it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, watching, well, for example, watching San Francisco, how it changed over the years. Familiar places like Ferry Plaza, and in 1906, there's something that, that puts us in touch with the past to see from the same perspective what a photographer in, in decades, maybe over a century ago, saw and thought about our hometown. A view from Rincon Point and how it was during the California gold rush. But to get it out of the way, let's use the definition of what then and now, or to give it its proper name, re-photography is. Um, if, if you go to, to the internet, re-photography is the act of repeat photography of the same site, duh, with a time lag between the two images, a diachronic then and now view of a particular area. Now, some are casual, uh, usually taken from a similar viewpoint, but without regard to the season or the lens size or even standing in the same location. By contrast, some are extremely precise and involve a careful study of the original image, right? It's enough of that. Most of my work is similar to the latter. It's uh, similar in terms of trying to get to the same location at the same time, but I'm not absolutely as crazy about it as uh, some photographers, um, I, I stand on the shoulders of great photographers of early years and real professionals in re-photography. I'll, I'll really give a, a big five to uh, Mark Klett, one of the great re-photography people. He put out uh, two books that influenced me, it was uh, Re-Photography, A Second Look, where he went back and he re-photographed a lot of the classic 19th century images of the American West. and. Uh, San Francisco after the ruins, San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake and fire. And I learned and was able to uh, work with Mark on a couple of occasions. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a class that I helped uh, him present in a little bit. But one thing I learned is that the closer you can get to the actual site of where the photograph was taken, the more helpful it's going to be. There's several books out on re-photography of old San Francisco views where the photographer, you can tell they kind of, you know, there was California and Drum Street and they kind of were on a, one corner, kind of looking in the same general direction. Um, I'm the kind of guy that has somebody hold up traffic while I set up in the middle of the street to try to not get run over, but try to get where that photographer was standing. Um, let me jump into it. And close to my heart is where I began my career as a, as a young park ranger on Alcatraz Island in 1974. And over the years, was involved with many uh, resource and research studies on the island. Alcatraz is extensively photographed, which makes it incredibly rich resource for following on how the island evolved over the years. And it has been totally changed. One thing that I worked on was a cultural landscape report. This is after I retired in 2006, where we wanted to document as best we could the changes at various times the island had been through. Photography was a, a huge help to us. Uh, the island as we see it today, it basically, it's unrecognizable for how it looked only as, as long goes about 1901, when this photograph was taken. The island has been rebuilt three times, usually using uh, convict labor to excavate, to uh, re-landscape, to rebuild, to demolish buildings, to cut away hillsides. 
one uh, some of the earliest photographs taken of the island were taken in 1869 by the pioneer photographer Edward Muybridge. Edward Muggeridge was his original name. He went out to the island in 1869, shot a number of views, including this one looking back towards San Francisco. It was titled it Pirate's Cove. Uh, news to us because the site was uh, totally filled in in the 19th century. And it became, the little cove became the site of, you can just see a corner of it up there, the big laundry building on Alcatraz Island. A lot of the re-landscaping or the recontouring of the island took place immediately after the American Civil War. The army decided the island was too big of a target and they decided to, using convict labor, level the island to cut it down so it would be terraced in two levels, uh, not as big of a target, put new cannons up, uh, new fortifications, and work went on for several years. But before it stopped, you can see in this comparison view, they got quite a bit cut away, uh, especially on the right, that tall sheer bluff. That's a 70 foot cut of solid rock. That was all done with uh, pick and shovel work by the convicts confer on the island. Uh, not civilians, uh, these were US Army soldiers on the island undergoing punishment. As they cut away the rock work, uh, they simply pushed it over the edge of the island, filling in a lot of the original uh, geographical features like Pirate's Cove that I showed earlier. That plateau at the uh, southeast end of the island, this particular photo, take about 1900, and there's one building there. It's the start of a large expansive wooden prison complex that was built on the tip of the island during the uh, what's the, we now call the Philippine War, uh, when the Philippines and the United States were essentially at war after the Spanish-American War. Uh, the Filipinos uh, weren't about ready to give up Spanish control to American control and a prolonged war broke out. A lot of US Army soldiers broke military law. They were sent back. They were housed on Alcatraz. The photo at the top was taken from the lighthouse looking down onto that forward part of the island. And this was a complex that was called Upper Prison. We know it existed. There are uh, some plans of it, none of which show the buildings in detail. However, a family living on the island about 1912, they took pictures of the island from one end to the other, the Sorensen family. And one of them went to the top of the lighthouse and shot looking down at what was called uh, by the military, upper prison. It covered the whole Southeast tip of the island. Go to the same location today, there is not a trace. It was uh, essentially, it was scraped clean by the army when the current prison building, the one that people see today, when it was completed in 1912, uh, there was an intentional move to get rid of this old, uh, wooden ramshackle complex. We learn some things from these photos. You learn things from photos that don't show up in the written record. For example, in the upper photo, uh, to the right of the prison buildings, uh, you, can, you can just make out the whole complex was surrounded by a tall wooden wall with a guard walk. To the right of it, you can see there's some hilly terrain. That's part of the original topography of the island that hadn't yet been leveled. We thought that it was all gone by the time uh, the uh, upper prison was built, 1901, 1902. No, there it still is in 1912. Uh, the records don't record it, but sometime after 1912, the last vestiges of this part of the island, were, they were cut away. Not everything was a prison on Alcatraz. View here is looking up the, the switchback road on the protected east side of the island. These were the large, uh, rather luxurious quarters of the uh, higher ranking officers on the island. Every army post has a designated area where the highest ranking officers live. It's university is called Officers Row. And the same location today. What can you learn from a view like this? Uh, things that we pulled out, among other things, that giant tree looks like it should be old as the hills. It couldn't have been there uh, at the turn of the century. Eh, there's a house there. Um, the planter boxes, little details on the left, like the whole line of little wooden 
uh, uh, planters marching up the top of the wall. Lower picture at some point, those were replaced by trough planter boxes. Sounds like minutia, but to uh, landscape architects, the historians, information like this is golden. Now this is real rivet counter stuff, but this helped immensely. The Sorensen family, this is uh, Amelia and her dog. And nice thing, they're posed uh, outside the big arched entryway to the prison, it's still there today. It's called the Sally Port. That was kind of fun to find this, a little slice of life. But I went a little further because I saw something when I really looked at this photo that explained something I'd always wondered about. If you look behind her, you can see there's a single missing brick in the wall. Look a little to the left of the red arrow. You can see there's a very tall wall behind her. In fact, her shadow at the bottom is actually kind of lapping up on the wall. Go to the same location today. There's that same missing brick. The wall behind her, it's almost been totally demolished. We did not know when that wall went away. That wall went back to the 1850s. Again, no one records this stuff. It's a lot easier to find in the old construction records when things went up than when things were demolished. Uh, we now had, I outlined the section of the original historic wall that was demoed. This is documentation. Another landscape view, looking down the uh, road on the east side of the island that leads to the industrial areas and how it looked in the Sorensen's time. They lived in that house to the left. The girls, the building in the background, the post headquarters, uh, the, it was called the post canteen or the recreation hall, still there in ruinous form. And uh, sometimes you, you get a little wacky with Photoshop and do things like this. It really helps having that human element in these historic photos. But where we walk, generations have walked before us including little girls and their kitty cats. This was a very practical application of re-photography and how it solved all the problem. This uh, giant cypress, recently it, it became of concern to the park management staff because this big cypress, uh, it's located right you can tell by the water tank in the background. The roots were starting to undermine a section of the roadway that the visitors walk on. And the roots were also working their way into the fissures of the natural sandstone of the island. And they were afraid it was going to be causing a safety problem. Some of the natural resource folks raised the concern that this might be a culturally significant uh, uh, survivor of the historic era when Alcatraz was a penitentiary. And uh, we probably shouldn't mess with it. And uh, I chimed in and I said, ah, I have a matching photo that I purchased on uh, eBay, uh, it was uh, dated by the photo print 1974. And there's the same tree, just barely visible as a seedling. It's a volunteer. Essentially what it meant is whew, it started growing after the historic period when the penitentiary closed down. Uh, doesn't mean you, uh, you have to keep it as big as it is, but it could be managed without destroying a, a, a cultural resource or a natural resource or both. And landscapes also do things like the main prison building, early landscape photography also captured the original appearance of the prison when it was first opened in 1912 when it had an, uh, an absolutely useless open colonnade along the, the front of the administration wing, different windows, different parapet on top, and also what we call small scale features. I, I love the mailbox in the, in the right foreground. I also worked on uh, a furnishings report. It mostly focused on what furnishings were where in the prison. The prison building is obviously, it's the draw on Alcatraz. People want to see Al Capone cell. They want to see solitary confinement. They want to see what they've seen in the movies. And the island, essentially, it was, uh, it was gutted uh, after the prison closed and after the Native American occupation. It was essentially a shell of itself. So we really had to set out to do some research on what was where when. It, 
if you think back for a second uh, that I showed the front of the administration building, on the right is how it looks today. And on the left, it's original appearance. Even though it wasn't taken to record information like this, we were able to pull out all kinds of information. Um, behind the uh, warden, standing on the right, you can see there's an old fashioned stand up uh, water cooler. On the left, would be a sand filled uh, ashtray. Uh, for, that was obviously the smoking area. Another photograph taken from the opposite angle looking back that I didn't include shows a bench to their right. This was the original entrance to the, the prison as it was built in 1912 and up through about 1962 when they built the infill that we have on the right. Um, will we ever restore to its original condition? That's debatable, but we, we collect the information. This one here was, was more of a uh, above ground archeological project. This was an interior that we couldn't figure where this picture was taken. Uh, the inside of the prison looks very different now. Walls have been rearranged. In this photo that was taken about 1945, we finally figured out where it was. Uh, the big giveaway was the column on the right center. It's still there, but everything else is gone. That whole uh, glass and iron enclosed room, that was the old control center, it was demolished in the late 1950s. Why couldn't we find it? Because it didn't really leave any physical traces. And I'll go back a sec. The door on the left, uh, it's lost its transom window. Uh, in the right foreground, there were partitions for the offices, all gone. The biggest clue, once we figured out where it had been taken, was the ceiling at upper right. It's actually armor plate. That's all that's left of the armor-enclosed uh, control center that was demolished. Now, then it made sense. Some then-now photos that we collected while doing the furnishing study the warden's office today and how it looked uh, just about the time the prison closed. Uh, pictures on the wall are uh, John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy. Desolate room inside the uh, industries building and how it looked when it was the office for the civilian chief of the prison industries located on Alcatraz with its wonderful uh, mid-century, uh, I guess you'd call that a kidney-shaped desktop. The cells, that's really key to understanding what life was like on Alcatraz. This is typical of how all the cells looked. Interior furnishings were gone. Paint was peeling. Not much to suggest what life was really like. But again, you turn to historic photographs. Plethora. That's a good word of historic photographs. In this case, uh, pictures that were taken during a 1956 press tour of the island showing the interior of a typical cell. Even evidence photos. This is an FBI photograph taken of the inside of uh, one of the cells that where the um, Anglin brothers and Frank Morris escaped in 1962 in the famous uh, Escape from Alcatraz escape. Using this information, we were able to recreate how a typical cell would have looked at a typical time. We didn't replicate an exact cell from a photograph on purpose, but we used the guidelines that were given to prisoners and a variety of photos. To, this is how a cell could have looked. And we can reconfigure them. In fact, they did reconfigure one uh, to look exactly like one of the evidence photographs. I was uh, lucky enough in uh, 2003 to work with uh, photographers Ellen Manchester and Mark Klett on a UC Extension class in uh, re-photography. And what they wanted to do was take classic 19th century views of San Francisco, 19th and early 20th century views of San Francisco and the Bay Area taken by pioneer photographers and take people out and teach them how to re-photograph the exact sites. Um, I had worked with Mark Klett a bit on uh, his book called Headlands Marin Coast at the Golden Gate. And they asked if I could uh, help participate, partly because I was a photographer, partly because I was a park ranger and I had keys to the areas they wanted to get to. Point Bonita, where the lighthouse is, that was a key location they wanted to photograph. 
Edward Muybridge photographed it 1872, circa 1872. Nearly the same location today. Nearly, because uh, topography changes. In this case, re-landscaping the uh, point and also uh, uh, different types of landform, uh, landslides and subsidence. We couldn't stand on the exact spot uh, where Muybridge said it had disappeared. Got pretty close though. And inter it, this interestingly, it shows the topography of the rock before the lighthouse was built. If you've ever been to Point Needle Lighthouse, you know you have to go through a marvelous spooky tunnel to get there. Well, the tunnel hadn't been built by the time Muybridge took his photos. It wasn't built till 1877, about five years after Muybridge was there. Uh, we found a photograph that matches location though. If you look at the circle on the left and the funny little notch in the rock, that's how you used to get to the Point Benita Lighthouse. You walked on what was called the gallery, a terrifying wooden structure that went around the rocky point. I'll go back for one section because you can see right below the circle, the notch in the hillside where the gallery was anchored into the rock. The lighthouse from the, the other side, at the turn of the century, it still had big steam boilers powering uh, steam fog signals. And uh, as a result, they had to have a chimney for as a flue for the uh, steam boilers and the uh, furnaces. And you had to have a copious supply of water. So the fresh water tank, all gone today. Interesting that the rock, the formation of the rocks underneath have maintained a lot of the similarities though. We went over to the Presidio, we went to the site of a famous photograph taken by uh, Carlton Watkins, a, a, a wonderful uh, photographer of the Old West. And uh, in 1868, the sailing ship Viscata went on the rocks at Baker Beach. We decided that we would try to relocate this one. The process that you go through, it's pretty, sore thumb, um, shoe leather archaeology, taking a picture, we walked the length of Baker Beach till we got to the north end. We knew it had to be the north end. That's the only end where their rocks are like this. And then you get up on the hillside and you uh, scoot back and forth and up and down until the landscape features pretty much match up. And this is what we came up with. And I got to say, we got really pretty close. Um, there's there's a feeling of pride in being able to go to the same location and feel of honoring the photographers that went before you. Um, I should say that the real pros of this, like Mark, they get so precise in doing their re-photography far beyond what, what I generally do. They will go to a site like this, set up, take a picture, uh, usually a, a Polaroid, and then they will actually mark angles on the Polaroid uh, photograph between various features and uh, compare those to the same angles in the historic photo. And they will move the tripod a mere few inches. They'll raise the camera up and down a bit. Mark even goes so far as trying to take the photograph at the same time of year so the lighting is the same. Um, I, I wish I had that luxury. Also wish I had the equipment he does. Uh, so I always want to say that uh, what I've learned, I've learned from folks like him. And while we were at Baker Beach, a lot of these are just fun. Uh, this is the classic shot of the Golden Gate Bridge under construction in 1936 and today. And, and I'll cop to it that some of my uh, contemporary photos like this one, um, I lifted from uh, the, uh, the internet uh, because I couldn't find an exact match. And I do this for interpretive purposes, you know, no copyright infringement intended. This was the big one that we wanted to do. Ansel Adams' famous photograph of the Golden Gate before the bridge. Ansel Adams took this photograph partly because he was one of many people opposed to building a bridge across the Golden Gate. And he wanted to document how the Golden Gate looked in all its majesty before the bridge, which uh, many preservationists were sure was going to destroy the landscape. And we tried to, uh, he wrote about taking the picture. Uh, Ellen Manchester and I, we, uh, as prep work 
for the workshop. We tried to uh, find exactly where he went so we could take the students there. Here's what Ansel Adams wrote. He lived uh, in, in the Seacliff area. And he said, uh, one beautiful storm clearing morning, I looked out the window of our home and saw magnificent clouds rolling from the north over the Golden Gate. I grabbed the eight by 10 equipment and drove to the end of 32nd Avenue, dashed out along the old Cliff House railroad bed, then down to the crest of a promontory. From there, a grand view of the Golden Gate commanded me to set up the heavy tripod, attach camera lens and focus on the wonderful evolving landscape of clouds. Well, what Ellen and I did was we knew what the route was of the old streetcar line that he talked about. And the promontory we figured was the Land's End promontory, which was maybe more famous nowadays for the site of the uh, now vanished labyrinth. So we went out there, nowhere near the location. So we're going, what promontory was Ansel Adams talking about? So we followed the uh, route all the way back towards Seacliff, holding up the photograph every few feet until we finally got to the place that's now called Eagles Point, where there's an overlook been constructed. There were no trees in Ansel Adams' days. When we got everything to line up, um, we were standing just about where the constructed overlook is, uh, the pine trees that have grown up in the foreground. You take them away from Ansel Adams' time period, and it matched up perfectly. Our mistake was thinking when Ansel said he went out along the uh, old streetcar right away, um, he meant that he went out. Actually, he was only about 100 or 150 feet off the sidewalk. And when you think that he was lugging an 8x10 view camera and plates and lenses, it makes total sense. Uh, it's a timeless photograph. <laughs> because it was so much less dramatic than um, we thought it would be to get to the exact site, and because of the Overgrowth. We didn't include this in the curriculum on, on the, the day's workshop. I was asked by the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy that runs the bookstores throughout Golden Gate Recreation Area. If I do a series of then and now photographs, that they could turn into postcards that would be for sale at the Land's End Lookout. And what they were actually looking for was photographs that were so precise that they could be turned into what are called lenticular postcards. I think you, you've probably seen these things. They're a heavy plastic coated postcard and the coating is actually prismatic. So as you turn the postcard, one image dissolves into another. And that was the idea that these photographs uh, could uh, be uh, used to dissolve one much like we're doing here in this PowerPoint. Uh, this Sutro Heights, statue of Diana the Huntress. And how she looks, I, I would say today, except she's much more vandalized than this now. So, so much so she may have to be removed. You got to do the cliff house. Uh, one thing they wanted was one that really emphasized how big uh, the turn of the century cliff house was. So I found a, a view I wanted to compare, walked out on the sands of Ocean Beach, my landmarks. They were seal rocks. and the rocks below uh, the Cliff House proper uh, on uh, Seal Rock Avenue. I wasn't 100% bang on. You run into the fact that the exact same spot either might not be accessible, or in some cases, it was the lenses that the photographers use. They might, uh, if anyone knows when you use a difference between a wide angle lens and a telephoto lens, it can shift the proportions of features. I generally tend to use a standard angle lens. That gets me pretty close. Um, also too, uh, you can, uh, I've done this, take a picture, can every picture, step right a few feet, step left a few feet, move forward, move back, hoping that one of them will, will be an exact match. And again, dodging waves. The Cliff House, uh, it's been such a landmark for so long, Photographers kept shooting it from the same angle, frequently using seal rocks at, as, as a backdrop, just drama. The Cliff House, uh, as it looked about 1864 when it was first built, and after it was enlarged, about 1870, Carlton Watkins again. As Adolf Sutro rebuilt it after it uh, burned down in 1894, this is the so-called uh, gingerbread Cliff House. 
And then the Cliff House that many of us remember, uh, this particular case, it was about 1958. They definitely wanted the sutro baths. They wanted when they could emphasize how big the sutro bath structure was as compared to what people see today uh, with the ruins. Went out to the uh, tip of a Point Lobos overlooking and ran into again the fact that the photographer who had taken this picture, uh, I.W. Tabor, he had stood at a different elevation than I did. Why? Because the tip of land, it was uh, quarried away by Adolf Sutro's workers. So I got close, yeah, but not, not as close as I wanted. It still does a very good idea of how massive the, the two and a half acre structure was that filled the cove. Did better on this one. This is looking east from the Land's End lookout. These photographs not only worked as the lenticular postcards, not all of them were turned into postcards, of course. Uh, they also worked for what we call wayside exhibits. When you walk around in the, in the parks and there'll be an, an interpretive exhibit about the history of the area and sometimes they'll include a historic photo. Many of these ended up being used as uh, interpretive panel photos. They wanted a photograph from the level as close as possible as the swimmers. And with the building gone, it was very hard to stand on the various stages and platforms and walkways where the swimmers might have once stood. Uh, but I worked my way down to what's now a uh, unnatural but very lively uh, wetland, uh, stood on the edge. And using the long seawall extending uh, from uh, far left to left center, that's the top of the uh, wall that enclosed the swimming tanks. How the same view would have looked. Up at Sutro Heights. Sutro Heights was lavish. There were over 200 pieces of statuary. There were uh, paved lawns. There were overlooks. There were observation towers. There were parterre flower beds. Almost all gone now. So a little re-photography here was in order. These are the lions at the entry gates to Sutro Heights. This is another one where I had to dodge cars to get the views. But it gives an idea of the vanished landscape. What looks like a lonely bird bath uh, surrounded by paths. This was the uh, carriage circle where uh, Adolf Sutro would meet arriving guests the birdbath was actually an elaborate fountain and the hill behind it for his conservatory was located. The conservatory exists only in photographs, but the archaeologists believed and were correct. There might be trace remains of it and archaeological uh, digs have taken place out at the conservatory site and they've uncovered sections of the uh, tile walkways that were inside the conservatory structure. Even the front steps have been uncovered. And then generally the archives carefully bury them back again to prevent them from um, basically uh, pot hunters. This one translated nicely into a interpretive panel because it shows Sutro's house on the right. Actually it was a very low key house, uh, not what you'd think that a Comstock millionaire would have. And the buildings on top of the parapet, those were actually enclosed water tanks now, they also served as uh, observation towers. The same view today gives a little clue of what once existed there. Another one I had to take for fun, this, this one came from the archives of the San Francisco Public Library. And uh, look at the, the seawall and the concrete walkway at left. All the same, but Playland, whew, it's gone. Every historic building needs a historic structure report in the National Park Service to tell the story of how a building was built and how it was altered over the years, uh, uses that it had. And one was written for Fort Point in the early 1970s, but it was very heavy on uh, 1860s construction, very light on later uses of the fort. So it was updated in the 2000s. I worked at doing the photography to uh, 
try to document the interior of the fort and took dozens and dozens of photographs of interiors. A little frustrated though that we couldn't do a lot of interior photographs, historic interiors, uh, probably because at the time when the fort was most historic during the 19th century, people weren't taking a lot of photographs indoors at the you know, technology for popular photography just wasn't there. We did get some ones that help explain what these features are, uh, the circular features on, it's called the barbette, the roof tier. There are cannon mounts. Uh, what can we learn from a photograph like this? Well, very clearly you can see on the left, the whole terraplane, it was originally grass and sod and uh, it was concreted over about 1912. I surprised myself with this one. Like I said, I've been taking photographs since I was a kid. This is one that I took in 1966 when my high school class got a tour of Fort Point. And when I was doing the re-photography um, in the early 2000s, I took this one. I, this was not intentional. It's just that it's interesting that my eye, the way I see things, hasn't really changed that much over the years. One of the few interiors that we have at upper left, a uh, young lady sitting on the, the cannon carriage, one of the huge Rodman cannon. There were casemates, gun rooms. There were 90 of them throughout the fort, all empty now but it helps explain without having to replicate a cannon how the rooms looked on the right fisherman on the fort point wharf the wharf is gone it's been rebuilt but the fishermen are still there this i, I love the continuity of people recreating in the parks you know people are people they're going to have their picture taken uh, horsing around on a cannon uh, dangling a, a line over the wall that's another thing about re-photography. It connects us with the people of the past, not just the vanished landscapes and, and buildings. On the fly re-photography, uh, I got a call when uh, workers building a new section of the coastal trail in the Presidio, they uncovered this big feature uh, and they weren't sure exactly what it was. They figured it was uh, a platform for mounting a cannon, but it was an odd location. So they uh, called me, um, I'm something of a fort nerd and because of the work that I'd done around Fort Point, we were able to uh, find a comparison photograph. Again, another Carlton Watkins view. This was the forward mount for one of a pair of huge cannon that were mounted in the 1870s as Fort Point was becoming obsolete. The army was upgrading its armament and these massive cannon uh, were emplaced sitting on big granite platforms. The platforms uh, were so thick, three, four feet of granite set on top of concrete, reinforced by brick, that in later years, the army, as they uh, kept upgrading fortifications, they just buried them in place. Uh, they were just too massive to demolish. What did we, once we decided what it was, uh, the contractors looked at, could it be preserved as a feature to interpret along the pathway? And it just couldn't do it. It was, uh, it was so low, uh, two feet lower than the surrounding trail, it would have just become a pool of water every time it rained. So it was carefully documented, measured, and then it was backfilled. Kirby Cove in the Marin Headlands, if you've ever been there, it's a wonderful little valley, totally forested. It's got campgrounds. It's got one of the most secluded, wonderful beaches. Uh, when I was the supervisory ranger in the headlands, I managed the campground there. And boy, people, uh, it was 90 days ahead, you could rent campgrounds and people were lined up at the front door of the visitor center 90 days ahead, wanting to be able to camp. In the picture on the left, taken about uh, 1912, 1913, those aren't campers, those are army soldiers. Uh, army soldiers, when they came to do artillery practice on the big guns, like in Battery Kirby at the left, they lived in tents. Uh, and again, it's not written, but at some point, trees began to be planted on the hillside around Kirby Cove. The photograph taken in the 1930s, you can see that what had been saplings at upper left, now it's a pretty well-established forest. So they asked me to 
find out what I could. And I couldn't find any written records about planting trees at Kirby Cove until the 1950s. And obviously a lot went on previous. So aside from the written record, I went to photographs. Fort Point with Kirby Cove in the distance, 1869, barren. 1908, barren. Showed you the photograph taken around 1911 with the seedling trees. 1930. And today, this gave a handle to the natural resource folks to say that whoever planted the trees had an idea when they planted them of what the boundaries of the trees were going to be, what's called a plantation of trees. And there's three different plantations that were planted at different times and they have escaped. You know, they're, they're doing what trees do, they're propagating, they're moving uphill. And a lot of them are sick. And this research that I did hopefully will give them the tools to manage the forest, to bring it back to a reasonable amount of tree cover, uh, stop it from spreading any further. The bad thing about tree spreading is they wipe out natural habitat. These are not native trees, uh, but they, boy, they sure like it here. This is one that Nicole and I worked on together. We give walks of the site of the 1894 Midwinter Fair, which was located in Golden Gate Park. And we, as we take people around, we like to show them what was there. And the fair has almost vanished, but there are a few vestiges that still remain. Essentially, the fairgrounds evolved into what's now the music concourse uh, with the Academy of Sciences on one side and the, the de Young on the other. So we take people on walks, starting in front of the de Young, making a big loop and stopping at various locations, pointing out surviving remnants of the fair using, what else, historic photographs. One of the big ones, the Japanese village that started out as a concession run by George Marsh during the 1894 fair. It was such a, a wonderfully, beautifully landscaped uh, piece of Golden Gate Park that it was maintained, the park uh, bought it, and it was turned into a public Japanese tea garden, same entry gates as from the 1890s. This is a view of the uh, cider press. They got the caption wrong in uh, 1894, they call it the wine press. It's not a wine press, it's an apple cider press statue. In the background is the manufacturer and industries building. It's gone, but the statue survives. Same location. Uh, the statue has not moved. Photographs reveal that the pedestal's changed. It's higher off the ground than it was. The bucket is an original. Somebody swiped the big bronze bucket. This is one of my favorites. I remember seeing this outside when I was a kid, the, uh, Gustav Duray's giant bronze vase. Uh, on the left, how it was displayed at the fair's end in front of what used to be the fine arts building at the Midwinter Fair. Afterwards, it survived until 1929. It was the original De Young Museum. And the Dory vase was proudly displayed right in front. I think it was the world's biggest bronze statue when it was created in the 1880s. Re-photography, it's in the same location today uh, after being moved innumerable times and even going on tour. The vase came back to Golden Gate Park and when the current De Young was built, the vase was placed back almost in its exact same location. The old de Young on the left with the Doré vase, you'll notice right off the bat, we've got a different Sphinx. Uh, the Sphinx on the left, that dated to the original fair, well, well they were just paper mache and uh, they began to self-deteriorate about 1904. So uh, the great California uh, sculptor Arthur Putnam was commissioned to create some new Sphinxes after the 1906 earthquake, still there. Couple of quick views. This is the Horseshoe Cove, Fort Baker. Over the years, it evolved into a hospital complex right along the shore. It was uh, called the Mine Depot because the army had underwater mines. The little cove was turned into a, a boat boathouse uh, repair facility, loading rooms. 
and watch the uh, concrete bunker at upper center called Battery Yates. It's still the same. Most everything else around it has changed. Now it's a yacht harbor. The buildings at left center were an army repair facility. On the left, the cleared area, that's the, the army had a giant um, field hospital there. Big loss is the uh, shoreline of the natural beach looking a little funky in this uh, circa 1910 photograph with that uh, driftwood piled up. This is there, it's buried under an army built bulkhead and long range uh, hope plan, hopeful plan would be to remove the bulkhead, expose the natural beach again. But that expression goes, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride, probably be a long time before the Park Service sees the money to do something like that. And to kind of wrap up with uh, what I would call um, for fun images, some I collect them just because they're cool. The uh, Sphinx in front of the De Young, about 1920, today. I grew up in the city, not too far from here. Uh, this was 24th and Fulton in 1912 and a big uh, casino building. That's what they called it today, where I used to catch the number five bus. View looking north uh, from 6th and Fulton Street, 1919. When I got my uh, car and was uh, when I was 16 years old, and uh, was driving from Westlake to uh, St. Ignatius every day. This was my route. And I always remember the profile of St. Ignatius Church on the horizon. Same view today. Surprisingly, a number of buildings have survived to this point. A number of them, also, they're gone with the wind, but uh, SI atop the hill, it uh, perseveres. Picture of uh, Clay and Jones Streets, August 1873, right after the first cable cars went, in, went into operation. Uh, Andrew Halliday's uh, amazing creation that uh, changed San Francisco forever. And today. And we'll tell it on ourselves. Uh, a group photo taken of the uh, Alcatraz Ranger staff in uh, January of uh, 1974. And we hold a 40th reunion. The fire truck is looking much better. We aren't. Uh, passage of time is documented on the human scale too. So we started with the ferry building, November 1907. And Super Bowl City in 2016. Um, part of the continuity of our lives, the, the ferry building uh, St. Ignatius Church, Old Fort Point. This is, uh, these are some of the reasons why I do re-photography, and I've also tried to share some of the things we've learned by doing the re-photography. So, thank you. And i uh, been talking for about 50 minutes, and I'll turn it back over to um, Nicole if she wants to do some uh, some then and now. Thank you, John. <laughs> Everyone's saying that you're fantastic, which is, you know, no surprise. Oh. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions for John? They were, you, everyone was so attentive to your talk that no one had any questions, but there's, thanks for making this happen. Thanks for a great show. So great. Nice job, John. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. No questions. Nobody has any questions for John, my cat. Oh my I want to know, so clearly you love photography. When did you first get into photography? It sounds like when you were in high school. Yeah, I mean, I had a brownie camera, you know, when I was 10 years old. But um, when I was in high school, uh, I joined the yearbook staff. And they had cameras they'd let us use, take pictures of the football games. But you had to turn them back in after the event. So I bought a used camera um, in Stonestown. My dad fronted me the money. I think I paid... Good amount of money, like 50 bucks for my first 35 millimeter. But I learned darkroom work, um, uh, did did my own enlarging, uh, did all aspects in black and white. Because uh, I'm mostly colorblind, I never really got into color, except to shoot a few slides. And then I dropped it. Um, 
I moved, had to get rid of my darkroom, and then digital photography and Photoshop. I um, mean, it's, it's uh, they're wonderful tools. Um, somebody asked uh, a friend of Ansel Adams, who who has long passed away, said, "Don't you think he'd be outraged at digital photography?" And they said Ansel loved new technology. He loved cameras. He'd think that this was the greatest thing ever. So. I'd, I'd like to think we're carrying on a great tradition. Oh, absolutely. Um, if you don't mind, John, I'm going to use that to plug an upcoming exhibition at Western Neighborhoods Project. <laughs> it's, it's all inspired by Ansel Adams. Yes. Uh, featuring absolutely zero photographs by Ansel Adams, but uh, creatively taking photos from our archive and sort of discovering his autobiography creatively in uh, throughout photos that speak to his experience on the west side of San Francisco. And we're going to have a Polaroid um, challenge that is connected with that because he was helpful to the man who invented Polaroid. Mm -hmm. So... That should go up as soon as humanly possible at the WNP Clubhouse. <laughs> you know, it, but, uh, when I was uh, uh, in high school, I thought maybe I'd make a career of being, of being a photographer. And oh. then I started looking at Ansel Adams and realized how far I had to go. And uh, that, you know, kind of took the wind out of my sails just because he, he's so fantastic. And then I started to see other photographers work and realize how far I had to go. And then somebody told me the reality that who makes money doing photography? Wedding photographers. Photographers doing you know, class photos. Even Ansel Adams himself didn't really start to make money as a fine art photographer with his landscapes until very late in his career. So um, yeah, I'd say being a park ranger is just as fun. <laughs> it does seem like you had a pretty fun career. I've seen I've seen photos that you shared with me of you out and about in different parts of the park. Um, we do have some folks uh, typing into the chat now. Oh, Tim mentioned that I should also mention that there is a wonderful Ansel Adams show that actually inspired our show at the DeYoung right now. It was just extended into August as well. So if you Ooh. haven't gone to see it, yeah, I have to go to maybe we can go together, John. Ooh, yeah. Um, thank you, Tim, for mentioning that. Um, and Matthew said, I am watching from the SS Jeremiah O'Brien, which might be the coolest location of one of our attendees, Matthew. My question is, where did the anti-aircraft guns that were on Alcatraz during World War II go? Um, back to the Army. Uh, we, we, we have a, a correspondence of the Army talking with the Bureau of Prisons about how Alcatraz uh, would be a key for you know, locating anti-aircraft defenses, national security. And they were erected in mid-1942 and they were gone by the end of 1944. All that we know is the army took them back. Um, they, we don't have serial numbers. There's a, no way to, to really trace what happened to them. Uh, we also have a question. Someone wants us to comment on the proposed 50 story building on Sloat. Uh, we officially have no comment on that structure. So sorry, Michael. <laughs> I officially have no comment, but I think I can say I really want to, wouldn't want to live in the shadow of that thing. <laughs> Not a WNP opinion. That is John Martini's own personal opinion. <laughs> yes, I don't like shadows. <laughs> Nobody um, likes shadows. <laughs> um, okay, anybody else have any questions? Are there any photographs that, um, are there any locations and photographs that you have in mind coming up to photograph or are, are you still doing this work or is this just work you've done in the past, John? Oh, no. Um, I did some a couple of uh, years ago with, with my good buddy, Steve Haller. Uh, we did some of uh, China Camp. Um, I, I actually have a whole series of uh, China Camp photographs then and now's that I put together that I'll use in the extended longer show for Ollie because uh, it's outside of San Francisco, essentially. Um, and uh, China Camp, if you've ever been there, it's a wonderful little complex of uh, 19th and early 20th century buildings. We did a cultural landscape report, Steve and I, tracking what buildings, as best we could tell, went up when, when they went down, developing streetscapes. And we re-photographed pictures that were taken in the uh, mid-1880s by a uh, photographer working for uh, Fish and Game. And it's amazing that a few of the buildings still survive. And what is that program coming up, John, in case folks want to see the extended version of this? Oh, uh, OLLI, uh, O-L-L-I, through uh, San Francisco State University. And I, 
um, blank what Ollie stands for. Long, lifelong living. At, lifelong Learning Institute? I think so, yeah. Yeah. What's up, Ollie? O-L-L-I. You can't go wrong. Sorry, yeah. Ollie, for butchering your name. <laughs> You're really nice people. Sorry about that. Okay, we have some more questions coming in. Um, our own Arnold Woods wants to know, <laughs> um, are John's old then and now photos for the Park Service available anywhere? They, um, I gave a, a bunch of my negatives to the National Park Service. I also gave a bunch to you guys. Um, they're not organized as then and now photos. They're just my photos. It, it, it's me and uh, Lightroom and Photoshop going around trying to organize the then and nows. We have um, Michelle Dana for the win, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Yay, oh. thank you. <laughs> Takes a village, thank you, forgot Michelle. The, forgot the Osher part, okay. Peter Field is giving a shout out to OpenSF History as like and be able, being able to do the now and then on your own. So there is a mapping version to OpenSF History. You can yes. pull it up in situ. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate that. Um, Tilly ha is asking any suggestions for websites or other places to find similar photos throughout the city. And John, I think you, I think you know just about every place to find historic photographs in San Francisco. Uh, well, definitely start with Open SF History. Plug, yay! And uh, the San Francisco Public Library, the the, the uh, History Room, they have a great online archive of uh, photographs. I noticed they're reposting them in higher resolution than earlier years. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, online archive of California, OAC, uh, they have uh, an extensive collection. And I can also recommend, uh, uh, actually give you the name of the repository, which is, is the, uh, at the California State Archive, the McCarthy albums. Uh, they, uh, he took a lot of uh, very high resolution photographs uh, up and down the, the West Coast, but a lot of San Francisco Saints. Oh, and we can't forget the Park Archive and Record Center in the Presidio. That's Mother. the repository for the, the wonderful uh, uh, Behrman glass negative collection and there's a lot of them by the uh, Billingtons so yeah uh, I talked to Am Amanda Williford she's a wonderful resource at the Park Archive and Record Center in the Presidio. Yeah we actually worked with Amanda and our, uh, our old boss over there may she rest in peace Susan Ewing Haley we digitized some of the collection and put it on Open SF History. So we actually have all the Behrman negatives on Open yes. SF History. That was super fun. And we're we're hoping we can help them out again with that. We've got a few more. Okay, hold on. Now folks are getting all, all, all up in the chat. I love it. <laughs> Jennifer wants to know where can we find some of the historic photos of the Cliff House that you featured in your program? Open SF History is the source for uh, many of them. And the other one is uh, our friend Gary Stark has a website called cliffhouseproject.com. And Cliff House Project, Gary uploads everything he can find in, in like, like 20,000 pixel resolution. And uh, his first fascination was the Victorian Cliff House. And he's got innumerable views of that. And then he expanded out to Sutro Heights, Sutro Baz, the environs. All the iterations of the Cliff House, and it's a uh, it, it's it, prepare to spend several hours if you're a Cliff House buff. Yeah, you can you can do a deep dive there. We actually um, took over management of Gary's website um, a, a couple years ago now, and by took over management, I mean we just pay the hosting fees. Gary's still very much involved in taking care of it. And a program, a virtual program that I've had in the back of my mind for some time is. I am a witness to all the amazing email back and forths that John Martini and a bunch of other um, content experts about the Cliff House and its environs go back and forth, identifying the most minuscule details of interior shots, exterior shots. I think we should just do a big old Zoom program, John, where we get all you guys circled up here on in the Zoom room. <laughs> Uh -huh. and let you go back and forth in real time. What I have, let us know, friends, if this is what it sounds interesting to you too. I know I love being witness to it, but I don't know if everybody else would. One of my one of my favorites, briefly, was when Gary found a photograph supposedly taken inside the bar in the Cliff House in the eighteen seventies, and he posted, 
and people are going, oh, yeah, well, the guy standing at the bar, that's that's Mr. Wilkins, who was the manager of the Cliff House. Here's another photograph of Wilkins and that's documented. Oh, and, and look at that picture on the wall and uh, look at the reflection in the mirror in the background. You're looking and, and that's Point Lobo. I'm going, how, how are they doing that? You know, I thought I was good, but no, this, what, what do we call it? Uh, collective research or uh, uh, crowdsourced. And yeah. It's fascinating to watch this. We did like a live version of that too with unknown location photos from the Open SF History Archive at our website. We bought y'all pizza and like had soda pop and like right. it was, I would love to do that again too. Although our web, our office is a little more cramped than it once yeah. was, but we do have another photo for you, John. Um, Matthew wants to know where were the sutro baths used by soldiers during World War II? Mm. I haven't read anything about the soldiers using them for training. Um, Flyshacker pool, yes. Sutra baths, no. Uh, there's, uh, I know from oral history interviews, there were a whole lot of soldiers and sailors and Marines using the sutras at that time, uh, mm -hmm. just probably looking for girls. And it was, it was supported by the uh, armed forces because they, they, they didn't sell liquor there. So it was a good, safe place for the guys to go. I've seen a poster where they did competitions uh, during the Spanish-American War. It was yes. like certain volunteer regiments were competing against each other. Yeah. It's important to find activities for soldiers that have a lot of idle time. Well, well it turns out that's one reason Angel Island for the Army and uh, Yerba Buena Island for the Navy were training and recruit centers. It's because you control the guys. <laughs> The interwar years are always uh, are always complicated years for yeah. soldiers. We have another question, John, from Jennifer. What was it like to be a park ranger on Alcatraz? I was there at the best of all possible times. We had just started the island, and it had only been closed for 10 years. So the people that were uh, staff who had worked on the island, they were still in their prime. You know, the guy was 35 when the island closed. He was a guard. He's 45. Um, convicts, they were coming out all the time. Uh, so we had the opportunity to interview these folks, uh, either formal oral histories or just sit down and, and shoot the breeze. Um, we uh, also, to the, they hadn't learned yet to say no to some of our very enthusiastic projects. And I, myself and my other buddies, we were crawling through the uh, attics. We were uh, we were down in the cisterns and in the sewers, things that you know the a safety officer today would 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 just have a heart attack. Uh, we survived and we learned a lot. The the part of the museum collection at GGNRA is stuff that we collected on the island during those years. Letters that we found squirreled away under floorboards, uh, old bottles, um, bits and pieces of uniforms. Yeah, that uh, that was great. And also too, I love giving tours as, as you can probably test, I, I love to talk. And um, I was given three tours a day, probably walking about four and a half miles a day up and down hills. And um, probably, I was probably in the best shape of my life. We, I worked at the Park Archives and Records too, for folks who, who didn't know. Um, and we started a, what we called the shenanigans wall, which was a wall where we'd post up funny things that we found in collections. And the inaugural photo for that shenanigans wall was a picture of John crawling out of a cistern <laughs> on Alcatraz. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know if it's still up, but I hope it is. <laughs> Any other questions, friends, before we let John uh, return to his evening? <laughs> yeah, there was a question from Arnold who wants to know if John's old then and now photos that you took for the Park Service, can you still purchase them anywhere? Can you purchase them? Yeah. Um, remember, I didn't necessarily shoot these as then and now. Uh, uh, they, they tended to sort of emerge that way in the course of doing the reports. And they would be included in the in the actual reports. Um, I'm thinking out loud as I'm saying this. I created them. They were included in a series of historic structures and historic furnishings reports. And those would be public domain because I, ooh. Ooh, yeah, because I did them under contract for the government. And um, you can find a lot of those reports uh, online uh, through the uh, the .gov. 
websites. A lot of them are uh, Alcatraz historic structure reports, the historic furnishings reports. Yeah. What I'm hearing is that this is a great merchandising opportunity for Western Neighborhoods Project. <laughs> we like the words public domain. <laughs> <laughs> And you can find them on the internet. <laughs> we'll discuss offline. Oh, Matthew's coming in with another one. Are there any Alcatraz army brats left? No. The last army brats that I knew, they uh, they died in their 90s. There were two brothers. Um, I think they were a, a year apart. They were the children of the uh, last, uh, what do you call it? Uh, executive officer, not the commanding officer, but is next in charge and uh, they were they were great guys we did some extensive oral histories with the stewart brothers but unfortunately they've passed on remember they yeah they, these people are, are nudging a hundred now to, to get back to the earliest days of the penitentiary operating so alcatraz opened his penitentiary 90 years ago so if somebody was uh, you know a youngster a teenager at that time they're well over 100 now I have now reached an age where when someone says 30 years ago, I still believe that means like the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not what that means anymore. <laughs> no, I got I to tell you, I realized that um, I started working on Alcatraz almost 50 years ago, which, you know, imagine when I was out there, if I was interviewing someone who had lived on Alcatraz 50 years previously, that puts them in the 1920s. That's, that's just unthinkable. I'm that, I'm that far removed um, from that time period. The years keep coming and they just keep coming. <laughs> they, they do, yeah. Brian wants to say uh, thank you, John, for a wonderful um, book, Sutro's Glass Pal Palace, that he loves your book. Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, I can't speak English today, but... Um... Um, Tilly would like to know if you ever made the postcards that you mentioned. Yes, a number of them were being sold. The lenticulars, the ones where you... You turn them. They were being sold uh, at the Lands End Lookout. I don't know if they still sold them. They I haven't been there for a while. Um, I think they were expensive to produce, and you know they didn't quite sell as fast as you know they would have hoped. But I definitely remember they they the the entrance gates to uh, uh, Sutro Heights and the Cliff House from Ocean Beach uh, were, were definitely for sale. You know, I bet if we produced them and I dressed up like a newsboy and sold them in front of Sutro Heights, you know, like, get your, get your postcards, get your postcards, that they'd fly. They'd fly, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about yeah. that. <laughs> um, David is asking, um, did Von Stronheim's Greed film at the Cliff House? Yes. They uh, filmed a couple of scenes, one on the bluff directly uh, overlooking the Cliff House, um they set up I, i've seen stills i think it was set up like a, a picnic area or something and uh, it's it's there just totally overgrown with trees now and they also filmed inside the cliff house it's the present cliff house that i'm talking about on the lowest level the terrace level there was a scene where they're sitting at a table uh drinking in in, in the corner and you can see people walking around in the background out on the terrace level that's it. it, it the Stroheim's uh, uh, movie Greed. It's it's frustrating because it was such a monumental work, and it was chopped to bits to make it fit a popular running time. So a lot of times, all that survives are still pictures from production. The uh, uh, but but I know that the the section where they're uh, actually inside the cliff house talking that is in in that's movie picture. We should do another program where it's just like, you know, movie scenes around San Francisco, uh, then and now historic photographs and mashups of film, film oh, stills. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, in all your infinite free time, John. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, oh, Joe said that my mom attended Marina Junior High and Galileo High School with children of the guards. That's right. Yeah, the, uh, they, they took the boat to school every uh, uh, morning from the island. And uh, back at night, and Galileo and Marina, um, but my uh, my friend Jolene Babiak, I think you may know Jolene. Yeah, she um, she went to a presentation for a while, so she you know it, it had wearing her little presentation high school uniform, had to uh, take the boat and then take Muni and uh, across town. 
it was a part of li part of living on the, the island. Um, yeah, I do a whole separate talk about Alcatraz called 250 Years on the Rock. But there was a very strong community on the island that, although they're dwindling now, they for many, many years had annual reunions. You can actually find Jolene on the island and Sorry. she'll like show you her family photographs. Yes. <laughs> she's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, uh, she wrote several books about the history of them because she's an accomplished historian. And she went out, I think using her, you know, gosh, you know, Mr. So-and-so, when you were a guard in 1962, really digging deeply into a lot of the events on the island, getting the inside skinny because people opened up to her as just, you know, one of the island kids like they wouldn't to, to other people. And she recorded everything and all of her oral history interviews that she, she gave them to uh, the Park Archive. Wonderful repository. Okay, we have another one from Matthew. Do you know how many shipwrecks are around Seal Rock near the Cliff House? We've lost track. So many ships have gone on the ground, ranging from giant ocean going uh, cargo ships like the Ohioan in the 1930s to any number of Italian fishing boats. Um, there were uh, uh, clippers that went ashore, uh, the King Philip, which I believe had been converted to a barge by the time it, it wrecked. Uh, no, I, I know that we say that there are some. Uh, don't quote me on this, but something like 11 major identified shipwrecks between Baker Beach and um, at, uh, and the foot of Rivera Street. Now, I don't I don't want to give it too much away here, but in October, <gasps> in October, no specifics, friends. Western Neighborhood it, Project is launching what we're calling Shipwreck Week. It's going to be like Shark Week, but with shipwrecks. And there's going to be an event at a local theater and some other nonsense. So um, John may or may not be involved. I, I can't tell you. I couldn't tell you. But uh, it's going to be very fun. And you should keep your eye out for, for October. Um, okay, here we go. I want to make sure I get everybody's questions in while we have John in the room. Does John know the best place to find a map of all the known Ohlone tribe sites in the Bay Area? A bit off topic, perhaps, but. <laughs> hmm. I would have to defer to others on that. I know that you can find maps showing the general locations of the various subgroups of the Ohlone. But if you're talking about this is where the such and such village was located, that stuff generally isn't publicized uh, to protect them from being depred from depredations. There are several uh, Ohlone and Miwok sites with, within the park boundaries of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. It's one of those, you know, we're sworn to secrecy of exactly where these were. Only one we talk about for sure because the tribes have said, it's okay, is that one overlooking Sutro Baths that we, we work to, uh, to preserve and to protect. Uh, they, the, the quote is, I remember the, one guy said, it, we didn't have a name, it was a seasonal village where they, they go to go, uh, anyway, shell fishing and uh, looking for uh, marine mammals. But one of the people that worked with the park archaeologists on preserving and saving the site, he said, Adolf Sutro lived there 30 years. We've been here 9,000. You know, please talk about us. Yeah. The American Indian Cultural District is a great resource and the Ramatesh Ohlone are very vibrant and very present. They have a great website actually that provides links to resources or resources too. I don't know the website off the top of my head. I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. um, if you Google it, you can find it. <laughs> Matthew said, bring on shipwreck week. <laughs> yes, Matthew. Yes. <laughs> there will be <laughs> hats. <laughs> oh, Oh, we should wear nautical hats. That's true. Um, <laughs> I won't make you do it, John, but I might. <laughs> um, Chelsea, did I miss any questions? Um, one just came in. What's left of the Cliff House? What's left? <laughs> well, that's a whole other program, Jennifer. <laughs> it's there. <Yeah. laughs> Best we can say. It, it, it is there, <laughs> and um, the National Park Service, so I'm told, although I'm not in any of those meetings, thank God, uh, that they are negotiating with a tenant and a new tenant, and it will hopefully be a restaurant before we all retire from these jobs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but uh, but you can still see parts of the Cliff House collection on display at the Western Neighborhoods Project Clubhouse when we do open it again for public hours. <laughs> it's coming shortly, I promise. <laughs> oh, I, I just uh, I just uh, saw one pop up. Is the arcade gone? I think what Jennifer is referring to is Muzi Mechanique used to be on the ground floor of the Cliff House. Oh, it, it relocated uh, close to a dozen years ago. But they're at Pier 45 now doing a land office business. Um, it's a, it, I, I know that the, uh, Dan Zielinski, who runs it, and he said they dearly miss the Cliff House, but boy, are they doing better now because every goes fisherman's <laughs> wharf you know here's laughing sal and the music and they they wander in it's a it's a it's a great location commercially and at least for now you can still see the whitney family totem pole next to the cliff house that we own although who knows how long it will be in that location <laughs> everybody's holding their breath on that one all right well i think i think that might be oh oh is there more that's me. <laughs> oh, that's just Chelsea asking you all to support our work. Yes, please. <laughs> like I said before, this recording will be recorded. This recording will be recorded. This recording will be available online at the Western Neighborhoods Project YouTube channel. You can search for us by typing Western Neighborhoods Project into YouTube. And thank you, John, for being here tonight. This was a wonderful presentation. This was fun. Thank you, John. Okay. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you on the next round. Good night, everyone. Good night.